Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, it, it's interesting. Certain people were not in the real estate business in the early 90s when there was a really the last downturn. So today I've assembled a group of young real estate executives who are young, and I'm going to tell you their age and their, their backgrounds, and who haven't seen the difficulties of the real estate market, and they're going to provide their perspective on the state of the market. My guests today include Jack Jaffa, the President and CEO of Jack Jaffa uh, and Associates, uh, real estate consultants, uh, Kevin Salmon, a uh, principal at uh, Salmon Marshall Investment Sales, uh, Peter Vandere, a Vice President at Marcus and Millichap, and last but not least, Ronnie Levine, Managing Director at Meridian Capital Group. So, Jack, you're 33. You're 37. You're 34, 34, and you're 30? 34. 34. So 15 <clears throat> years ago, 16 years ago, none of you were uh, in the real estate business. Now, all of you have been in the real estate business how many years, Jack? Um, 11 years. 11 years? Same, 11 years. 12 years. 12 years. 12 years. So you're in 11 to 12 years, and you came in, so if you're 11 to 12, we're at the end of 2009, you came in in 97. The world was getting better, and the things were there, and, and you were there in the boom days, 2006, 2007. I mean, it, you could be stupid to make money in, in those days. I mean, those were the, the great days. So how do you, I, I mean, one of the, your specialties is that you take care of violations and other situations. How do you see the market today <coughs> in, in the end of 90, uh, 2009, 2010 to 2006, 2007? I think uh, people, uh, you know, today are not as much concerned about their violations uh, that they were prior to it. Um, in the aspect of violations going into default, uh, not occurring violations uh, in the aspect. You know, before they were refinancing, they had to take care of these violations. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different uh atmosphere in the aspect of violations at that time. But besides the violations, I mean, you know, R Ronnie's firm would, uh, did $5 billion last year. You know, they're the premier, uh, you know, investment sale, uh, mortgage financing brokers in the country. Um, they, you know, people go out and, you know, when you're selling a building and you're selling a building, they have to get financing. People are becoming, are lenders becoming more stringent? They're looking at violations? What's, what are, you know, how are lenders reacting? How, you know, before they'd give you 90% of the money, 95%, you know, the sky was the limit. What do you see happening? Well, I think lenders are being more conservative across the board. I think that, you know, multifamily finance has been 
one market and you've got the rest of commercial real estate, which is, you know, there's almost two separate answers to that. I mean, but So give me the answers to both well, since you uh, put yourself into the... Uh, sure. On multifamily, certainly, um, they're the most abundant amount of financing in the market for multifamily. You've got Fannie and Freddie, very active. You've got HUD active. You've got the community banks in our markets that are still very active. So, you know, that financing, there's still plenty of liquidity for multifamily deals. Yet, you know, th there are violations on these buildings. I mean, somebody has to, you know, when somebody's going to do a loan, they want those violations paid off when he's selling a building or when you're selling a building. Well, Jack can answer this question, but I mean, not all violations right. are created <laughs> the same. What's so. happening is that a lot of the times the banks would come and they'll say, We'll close this loan. We're going to want X amount of dollars in, in escrow, reserve, correct? In escrow, in order to you take care of these violations, or you're going to have to do these improvements down the road, and we'll hold this money in escrow, and we'll give you a reserve on the X amount of dollars. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I would deal with uh, various different banks uh, that would say to me, "We're not closing this loan if there is a lead paint violation on this pro in the building." And now. Uh, I think now this, there's no question about it. They wouldn't even look at it. They would say to you, we're not even giving you an offer and telling you what we're going to uh, give you until you clean up all these violations. So I think that the banks are taking a, a one step further of making sure that the properties are free and clear of the violations. Now, let's, let's look at it you know, from the investment sales side. Uh, both of you, you know, have been involved with investment sales for 10, 11 years. Um, how do you see the market today? Well, you know, going back to 2007 uh, and today, his business, what he's, what he's doing uh, today gives buyers a better opportunity to negotiate. In 2007, you had no chance. If there are violations on the property, you had to buy it as is. Today, you, you can tell a seller, well, listen, you have to clean this up before we can move forward. And that's, that's actually a benefit for guys that are trying to jump into this market. Now, you, you and your partner went into business in 2009, so certain people say it's th sometimes the best time to go into business and the toughest time. How have you seen your first year in business? Well, um, I, I certainly, it's very exciting for us because um, the second we jumped into this business in, in our own market um, in April, we, we started out with three three properties to sell and we've actually uh, sold two of them and another one to contract so for us we're doing very well now my, my question Peter you, you 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 I'd say your specialty has been multifamily over the over the period of time yes how do you see the multifamily market and I think it's in different classes is what we said prior to the show you know the, at one time you know the sky was the limit. My former employer, uh, we didn't care what the building. Give us a building, give it vacant. I remember, as I told Kevin once, I saw a building, I, I told the owner, you should be shot. He said, hey, you have a great opportunity. It's a vacant building. I said, the building's a slum. He said, but you can probably make money on it. You're going to get anything. How do you see the, the, the changes of owners uh, and buyers today? Yeah, well, the multifamily market's changed um, depending on you know, like you say, what class you're talking about. You had a lot of multifamily activity that was all based on you know, speculation or, um, you know, what they were going to do with the property, you know, two to three years down the road, whether that be, uh, you know, co-op com uh, conversion, condo conversion. So those those prices have changed dramatically. Uh, you know, we at the sh prior to the show, you were bringing it up, which is interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, people wanted a building and they preferred it to be vacant or right. as close right. to vacant as possible because they wanted to convert. Everybody was condomania, as yeah. I would call we, it. We would have conversations with owners and you'd have an occupied building and then the building next door would be vacant and you would tell the owner that his next door neighbor, which is completely vacant, is actually worth more that, uh, than his, his is occupied and he'd scratch his head and say that doesn't make sense and you'd, you know, you'd have all that. But are, are buildings being sold today? For condo conversion? No. 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 I mean, not for anything immediate. I mean, I think, you, you know, without a doubt, you still have a long-term viewpoint of many of the investors in the market, and there are still locations and buildings that people will look at and say, hey, eventually this is going to be a terrific conversion. But you can, it's very, you, you're not really attempting to sell on a conversion in, you know, two or three years. That's, that's not a... Uh, winning game plan today. What, what about the boroughs? You know, I don't want to be Manhattan-centric. Uh, I mean, you live in Brooklyn, you live in Manhattan, you live in Manhattan, live in Manhattan, and you live in New Jersey. 
<clears throat> I mean, where do you see uh, have have values declined in the Brooklyn market, Queens? Uh, I mean, Manhattan is still probably the best market. How do you look at it? I look at Manhattan. I think Manhattan is the top of the market at this present time. Um, I see. You know, I see in my aspect that there's more transactions happening in the borough of Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, you know, in transactions of multifamily than, uh, than the Bronx and, and Queens. What, what about you? Um, I, I think the biggest difference that we've seen happen in the boroughs is that you saw investors over the past couple of years buy properties in the boroughs and have appreciation factor into part of their calculation of why they buy it. And what we, you've seen this year is that's, that's not existing in the boroughs anymore. They're buying on cash flow only. And, you know, as that makes us up the return, that's where you've seen the price reductions. Now, you used, to, in that you used to spend a lot of your time in the boroughs, but I, this year you've sold basically all, all Manhattan, right? All Manhattan. Um, we thought Manhattan would be the best opportunity to work on because you can just uh, drive in a number of investors from all about. Um, I focus primarily on the Bronx, and I've seen a tremendous amount of activity in the Bronx because uh, two years ago properties were selling at 80,000 per unit. That same property is now selling at 40,000, 35,000 units. So, so now I ask the guy who put the loans on it. So when two years ago, you know, some, somebody came to you, it, it had to be stupid. I mean, any bank, you know, they all wanted to do loans. They, they all wanted to do business with Meridian because Meridian was the source to all this. So if he had this deal at 80000 a unit, how do these banks like New York Community Bank, Diamond Williamsburg, Signature, you know, all of these banks look at a deal to them? Well, I think the, you know, something that was a dynamic that really changed in the outer boroughs was you had institutional capital back at the height of the market leave Manhattan and go to the outer boroughs, which was unheard of. But, you know, to, to find deals, the institutions needed to, needed to leave Manhattan. So you saw big bulk package deals happen in the outer boroughs, and they were bought on the premise that they were going to buy these packages with rent-stabilized tenants, and they were going to, over time, increase the rents. And a lot of these deals got financed, you know, at a 1-0 debt service or even below 1-0 with, you know, an interest reserve. And as they turned over the units, everything would be fine. So you had a lot of those deals that were done in CMBS, not just in Manhattan, but in the outer boroughs. You know, we, we, we have to know inside baseball. What is CMBS for my audience? What does that mean? Collateralized mortgage-backed security. And that was the business that you came out of, which basically said, let me take anything and I'll put it in a package and I'll sell it to some person. And if it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. Well, look, I mean, you know, the problems with the CMBS market are well documented, and I think that, you know, the issuers got obviously way too aggressive, and, you know, the collateral in the packages, you know, you could scratch your head at some of these loans that were underwritten, you know. So, so in 2010, where do you see the, the finance market? I think already, you know, I think that people, you know, it was at a complete standstill earlier in the year. There was absolutely nothing happening outside of multifamily. If you had a deal that wasn't multifamily, there was really no bids for the financing or one or two guys that would give you, you know, a bid. There was a lot of finance companies started thinking that we're going to get all these low leverage deals at 9% and we're going to put all out all this money and it's going to be, you know, we're going to be doing 15 debt yields at 8-9%. I don't, I haven't seen that materialize and I think that you know, there's been a real lack of transaction flow in the market and, and, and capital building up. And as the capital is built up and there's not a lot of deals, it's just simple supply and demand. The interest rates have actually come down. And I think, you know, for, the, for, for good commercial deals and also the sweet spot in the market, you know, the large loan market, you know, I would say above $100 million, we'll leave that aside. But if you have like a 50, 75 million, $25 million deal in today's market, um, and you're looking for 65% financing and it's a 12 debt yield, there's a lot of people that'll look at that deal today. And the rates have come down in the last couple the of months. The rates have gone down, but the bigger problem is there aren't that many banks who want to take a $65 million deal. I mean, they want to do more club deals, as we would say. I would say the sweet spot to hold is probably 30 to $40 million. But these banks are, are very good at, at clubbing deals today. And also, you are seeing people aggregate 
or talk about aggregating for CMBS pools? I mean, I know there are several lenders in the market. I mean, there were three <laughs> deals that were concluded in 2009. There are, are, are lenders who are going to go into the CMBS market, and they're going to want to use your service, and they're going to do a variety of things. Um, uh, Goldman Sachs definitely is going to do deals $25 million above. Chase is going to be doing that. JP Deutsche Morgan, Bank. Deutsche Bank, they're, they're all going to be there. Now, you know, I don't want to make this, you know, myopic and put it only on the multifamily. There, you know, there are different asset classes in real estate. You know, there's retail, which we discussed. So how has the retail market been affected, you know, uh, in 2009? I mean, in the hot days, anybody would say, I want a retail condo. I, I'd, I'd have a retail store. How do, you, how do you see it in 2009? Well, it, you know, the one thing that's been clear is, you know, if you're selling a building with a retail component on it, uh, the lenders are discounting the retail uh, a portion of that income stream. It's making it di more difficult to finance. You've obviously seen vacancies increase, you know, in almost virtually every neighborhood. I mean, you know, you had a, a, a friend, you know, walk up Madison Avenue a couple of months ago this year and say, I can't believe how many, I've never seen this many vacancies on the street before. So, you know, everyone's got their caution flags waving when you're bringing a deal uh, to, you know, to get financed or to market, even from the buying community. Um, there's a lot of questions about retail. It's, it's, it's more difficult to do a, re a deal with retail component in it today than, you know, just a a you know blanket I, I think you know it, it's 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 partially in that definitely on that but the the other point is you know at one time there was something called the credit tenant you know yeah. when, when when entities like AIG you know Fannie and Freddie you know these companies go bankrupt you know Bear Stearns you know the so where is the credit tenant uh, I mean you know you you know, you're, you're scared when you do a tenant sure I think it's non-existent we're we're actually marketing a uh, retail condo right now in Manhattan and um, the tenants a bank a bank with over 12 billion dollars in assets and we're selling it at a nine and a half cap we can't find new one you know it, it's very interesting uh, I was with Ronnie's colleagues about a year ago a year and a half uh, we were having dinner in a restaurant and th that night WAMU went out of business and the, the I think the guys who I was with nearly, you know, nearly fell on the floor. Uh, that was, you know, WAMU went out of business. You know, you know, if you look at it this way, you know, in 2009 we've had 140 bank failures. In 2008 we had 27. In 2007 we had three. So you know, banks. Banks are no longer credit tenants. You, you don't know well, what, what... It's not just a question of the credit of the bank, but typically the bank branches are paying way above market rent. Right. So you're seeing that cap rate because the banks were going around the city swallowing up every corner they could. So, you know, that cap rate is probably indicative of a market or a rent that's way above market. So, you know, I think that that's really... The lenders are now looking at, you know, to your point before, they're, they'll look at a retail deal. They don't have a problem with retail per se, but they're going to re-underwrite to what they believe the current market rents are. So if you have r leases that were signed at the height of the market, they're going to look at those leases and say, guys, if this tenant goes bankrupt and a new tenant has to come in here, we want to underwrite this deal as if a new tenant's coming in. I, I mean, if we look at what happened in 2009, just, you know, perhaps the, the last transaction of 2009, the sale of... Uh, for New York Plaza, uh, a 41-year-old B-plus building, um, which was built by manu manufacturers Hanover Bank, which then became J.P. Morgan Chase, the building traded for $97 per square foot, and the only reason it's traded for $97 a square foot is because they had J.P. Morgan Chase leasing 75% of the building. You know, when you know when you were selling air rights, or when you were selling vacant land, or when you were financing it, you know, land in the Bronx was selling for $75 a foot. Land in Manhattan was $350 a foot, $400 a foot. What do you think land is worth today? Well, air is worth nothing. Land in, in the Bronx is probably worth about 15 bucks a foot. And what about in Manhattan? Manhattan's probably a hundred bucks. I think that's a difficult question to answer with, without segmenting where in Manhattan. No, no, I, I'm not. No, really I, I think that I think the best land, the best Manhattan. land in Manhattan, right? You got to look to the Drake site and see where that ultimately trades, right? 
That's you know that's a unique site. You know I remember when the Mayflower, Mayflower Hotel site was so for sale, and that was 15 CPS. You know so it was a unique site, the Drake site. But a couple of weeks ago I did a show and I had residential developers and some very top-notch residential developers, and they said we won't build unless we get the land for zero or next to zero because it just doesn't pay. I don't, we're not seeing that. We're working with several clients that I think will pay in Manhattan anywhere from 100 to $200 a foot depending upon where the land is and they fully intend to warehouse the land and hold it. You know, I think I, on, I think, I don't there's, believe. We have sites right on Fifth Avenue in very close proximity to this building that, I, you know, they're talking lenders selling notes, not even fee positions. Hundred and twenty five hundred. Thank you, one hundred and twenty five dollars. Yeah. But that was land because two blocks away from our studios, I remember when the land sold for four hundred and twenty five dollars right. a buildable yeah. foot. <coughs> so the, the world has changed. Yes. Now you also, be, besides doing the violations for residential, you do the violations on office buildings. How how do you see that? I see I see that the violations again. You know, uh, the city is issuing violations left and right to every any, any development site whatsoever. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I, I see it's constantly day-to-day -day operation that, you know, you have violations that are going on uh, office buildings because they just see that the violations are just adding up on the portfolio of these buildings. They don't, uh, you know, the owners don't really have the biggest, biggest concern on, on, this, on, these, uh, on these aspects of, uh, on the prices. Um, I think that the prices of the real estate in the city of New York has gone down and uh, the banks are really concerned about all these various different things. To your point about land though, I think values are down, I mean, some people like you said won't put any value on it because you can't get construction financing and if you were going to buy a piece of land today you wouldn't get a, you couldn't get financing to buy the land. So, you know, values could be down, you know, 50, 60, 70 70%. percent. You know, it really just depends on where the site is. What a, what are values down But for? you still can't build you still can't buy land and build a rental today in most locations because the you know, either you can't pick it up at the, at that price or you know, and the question about where the rental market's going, you know, going to ultimately settle. And you know, and that's that's a that's a log jam in terms of, you know, d you know why you can't another thing why you can't build yeah, land. Yeah, I, a very interesting. In two thousand and nine, the transaction that took place in Harlem on one hundred and sixteenth Street, I had seen the the transaction when I was with Apollo, and a very fine guy had the property, and he he expected to get fifty five, fifty six, sixty million dollars, and I said, George, it doesn't make sense. He said, but. I have a great piece of land. I have this building. I said, George, it just doesn't make sense. The building sold for this, the building and the land sold for sixteen million dollars from sixty million dollars of what he expected. Now he pr he needed the money. Did he lose money? I'm not sure. But I think part of that situation relates a little bit to what you, the two of you, brought up, uh, and also you, Ronnie, with regard to, to to different parts of the city. I mean, everybody, you know. Everybody wanted to go to Harlem. Harlem, everybody was going up there. You know, it was the yuppie village. You know, everybody wanted to go to Harlem. Everybody wanted to go to, to, to Williamsburg. Uh, and now, you know, you, we spoke to you about a uh, property. In, uh, Harlem is not moving. You know, uh, parts of Brooklyn. I mean, I was in downtown Brooklyn recently. I mean, it, it's like they have, you'll have a lot of uh, potential foreclosures to buy in downtown Brooklyn. I mean, th there's nothing happening. Well, you're, you're seeing the, that, you know, in the good times, everything was a prime location. Williamsburg, you know, the transportation is issues weren't addressed and people were still picking up those properties. And now the, you're really seeing the rubber hit the road with rental rates and, and, you know, a prime location is performing better than a non-prime location. And, there were, there were a lot of assets. Now, now sold in your in prime, when you were in 2005, six and seven, had you ever did you sell any sites for uh, a word that is normally out of the dictionary to the hotels? <laughs> I mean, you know, well, I didn't sell any, but we we looked at financing a bunch of hotels, and all you know, I think that that is the hardest asset class in today's market to get anything done on. I mean, certainly a hotel construction loan is is not in the in in the cards, but even permanent financing is extremely difficult for hospitality. But, you know, what you see is kind of developers have a piece of land 
and the business plan for that piece of land shifts as the financing market shifts. So you have a guy that paid too much for a piece of land, he was going to build condos. And then they see, well, if I do the underwriting at 75% occupancy and $300 a room night, that looks pretty good as a hotel. So now my condo site is a hotel site. So you've seen people that paid too much money for land kind of chasing the market. It, it, it's interesting. The, the week before you guys appeared, uh, I had a... Um, a dev not a de he is a developer, but he's also in the construction business. And we were talking that he had his holiday party in this hotel in the Bowery in a fancy section. And he says, I have a lien on the property. I said, you have a lien. I know the three lenders who are being foreclosing on the property. He said, it's a great property. I said, yeah, but the the projections were $700, $600 a night. And now they're lucky to get $300 a night. So it's a, it, it's a tough time. I mean, the, so so when do you see... In, uh, you know, you have my apple, so I don't have my crystal apple over here. <laughs> but normally, I try to get a, a crystal apple before the thing. So, you, Mr. Jaffa, when do you see the world getting a little better? 2010, 2011. I, I hope sooner. Than, I hope sooner than than later. Uh, I, I I think that it's <coughs> going to turn around uh, very shortly. Um, I think that we. I just mean, then you'll get a little gray hair otherwise. You know? Yeah, I think that we uh, we just have to uh, basically just hold out and just uh, be strong and. Uh, you know, as I say to the people, take care of your violations now because what's going to happen is the violations are just going to pile up, going to default, and then, uh, you know, the banks are not going to be too happy. Nobody's going to be happy. And uh, the bottom line, just take care of your Peter, uh, stuff. As I think as the uh, residential uh, rental market uh, firms in 2010, and that sets a floor and that uh, allows, you know, investors have something to put a foot on, and that will be one of the things that they stake some activity on. Kevin? I think it should be a, a slow climb. It, you know, if we go back uh, feeling like it's uh, 05, 06, 07, another two years, we're just going to go right back don't to where it Don't worry. It's, it's, it's like your hair. It's not growing back that fast. <laughs> I don't think it is, but we definitely need a slow climb, and we'll have better understanding. And, and last but not least? It's a tough question. I mean, I think jobs is a real important I think that's a variable, great. and until you see some stabilization and unemployment and some job growth, I don't know how you could answer that question, but I would say that what the market needs is transactions. You need data points so people can understand what value is. And today, there's just people don't want to chase deals because you're just not comfortable that you're at any point. You just don't know if you're getting a good deal because you don't know where the market's going to settle out. So I'd like to thank my four young real estate executives. The world will get better. It may take a little while longer, but the things have, will be there. I'd like to thank Jack Jaffer. Uh, Kevin Salmon, Peter Vandere, and uh, Ron Levine. Uh, see you next week. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, The Wickoff Group.